Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With me today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you. How are you this morning, Dr. Paul? Doing, doing well, doing good. well. Good. Well, a little bit of sad news. Uh, we had our fingers crossed. We uh, expressed a little bit of hope uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, we thought peace was going to break out in the peninsula of Korea. Of course, we never really believed it, but we were hopeful that we'd keep moving in that direction. Besides, uh, for real peace to break out under those circumstances would have taken a lot of time. But it looks like a major setback. So we're not totally shocked. I mean, it's surprising to, uh, that it hasn't happened sooner. It's surprising that we got along this far with at least some conversation and teasing the South uh, Koreans with this possibility. And I'm sure a lot of North Koreans, too, you know, that they'd actually be talking and living and working together. But it looks like it's all been canceled. The, the message we get uh, from the administration is that bad guy in North Korea, Kim, sent a belligerent letter <laughs> and the whole ball game is off. He, he, he wasn't kind enough, but we don't know exactly what was in the message. There's a lot behind the scenes that really prompted this. One is there's a few people in the uh, Trump administration that didn't want us even talking to North Korea. But anyway, this was big news because all of a sudden Pompeo is ready to get on the airplane, go there and... and uh, and, and, and meet with Kim, and all of a sudden it, it gets canceled, automatically canceled. So uh, that, that's where they are now, and uh, it looks like it's, it's an argument back and forth, uh, charges made against North Korea, and, and it looks like the uh, United States is, uh, you know, resuming uh, their belligerent attitude about, uh, you know, uh, war games. Which, which you, you know, in a way, it makes no sense. Does it make us more powerful to have war games? It's just intimidation, you know. But anyway, that's back again. So I don't know whether we're all the way back to square one. Uh, uh, Trump always uh, concludes these episodes uh, with saying, well, it's not all over. Maybe we can work something out next month or something like that. But right now, it, it doesn't look very good. But uh, we shouldn't be shocked. Uh, but the interesting part, and we might talk about this, is is that uh, Kim, <laughs> South Korean president, he, he doesn't look like he wants to give up. And that is big news, and that is important. And uh, it would be very, very difficult for him to go on his own. But I think he is speaking for the large majority of the Korean people, North and South. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, Pompeo, as you say, was about to get on the plane. Uh, the letter is actually written by someone under uh, Kim. It wasn't Kim himself. Uh, we don't know what it is. Josh Rogan wrote about it in the Washington Post today. It was something uh, very belligerent, supposedly. But uh, Pompeo, you know, goes over to the White House, shows Trump the letter. Trump says, oh, don't go. And, you know, P uh, Bolton didn't want Pompeo to go in the first place. Pompeo has always had a very hard line. Remember, those two are the ones that were saying the Libya model is the model to go for you know, with North Korea. So it, it, it makes you wonder, is Trump that easily hoodwinked? These are the neocons just running circles around him and he can't even keep up? Or is he in on the game? It's one of the two things and I don't know which it is. No, I think it's going to be hard to figure, figure it out. But, uh, you know, in our title to our program, it isn't a joke because they've actually talked about that because now, uh, you know, because Kim wants to go up and he's still going to have a meeting next month and he wants to open uh, an ambassador, uh, embassy-like office up there. But if you put electricity in it and some heat in an office, uh, if they get there, it would have to violate the sanctions against North Korea. So somebody said, well, maybe maybe we'll end up putting sanctions on South Korea. And it, it may... It may turn out we, we put sanctions on so many people, even the people we continue to pretend we like and go on with a lot of trade. But sanction this, sanction that, just threats in, in, uh, in the innuendos that we're going to do a lot more. But this whole idea is so preposterous, you know, that uh, they'd even throw that out, that um, yeah. they might have to put sanctions on South Korea. And this is actually a piece that we, we both saw from Tokyo Business Today, written by Stanford professor Daniel Snyder. And actually we have a, a JPEG. This is what initially caught our attention yesterday and made us want to talk about it a little bit. Here's uh, the professor. He's quoting a senior U.S. official. We've got a big problem coming with South Korea. This is a U.S. official. It has reached a point where the South Koreans are determined to press ahead. They no longer feel the need to act in parallel with us. And then it goes on, as you pointed out, Moon is planning to go up to Pyongyang 
uh, next month and thinking about opening some projects. Uh, but here's another thing that's interesting. This is what you just said, Dr. Paul. Some officials warn that the U.S. is prepared, prepared to sanction South Korea if it proceeds in trying to make friends, trying to make peace with the North. If that's not the height of absurdity, I don't know what it is. It doesn't sound like we have a whole lot of peacemakers in Washington <laughs> negotiating for us. But, uh, you know, and, and some of it is almost impossible to resolve, and you wonder about the motivation. You know, if uh, one thing that the North Koreans would like to have is a peace treaty. Yeah. You know, they, we haven't been technically at war with them for a long time. Uh, it's interesting that the United States signed the peace treaty because it was a U.N. operation. Let the U.N. sign the mm -hmm. peace treaty. But anyway, hey, they want a peace treaty. But the United States... Even at the height, the most positive comments about working with North Korea, they didn't want a peace treaty. And it turns out that the real reason why they don't want a peace treaty is they can't justify, uh, you know, all those troops in South Korea. <laughs> so if if they don't want to go too far where they'd have to be on the spot and say, well, why don't you, why don't you bring the troops out? Uh, you know, they, the intentions weren't very good. You know, they, they, they didn't have good intentions anyway. But uh, that's one reason why it wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't happen. But uh, the thing that we want uh, from North Korea, you know, is... Uh, is a full explanation about their nuclear programs, everything else, things that we know they're not going to do, things that we have put up with with many uh, of our uh, enemies, you know, uh, when, when the communists were in charge and uh, like in, in Russia and different places, we, we would talk to them. If we'd have ever put, you know, the same demands on them, we'd still be in a very, very hot Cold War, but it looks like these people are trying to start, stir up uh, another hot war, Cold hot war. Yeah. You know. well, this is what the neocons were saying all along. Essentially, the neocon line on North Korea is, hey, you know, we'll, 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 uh, you go ahead and give up all your weapons, give up your nuclear weapons, tell us all about your technology, let us come in and inspect it all, let us, uh, who, I forget, maybe it was Bolton that said, where do we park the truck to start taking the stuff away? This is, this is their approach, and then later on maybe we'll give you some stuff. Well, the thing is, the U.S. has lost all credibility because you know what happened with Libya when Libya gave up it, its weapons. Uh, and we know what happened with Iran when you made a deal with the U.S. The U.S. just backs out of it. So there's no way they're going to, they're giving, making them an offer that they cannot accept because they know. And this is, I think, what they have in, what they have in mind. So Bolton, Pompeo, and the neocons are getting exactly what they want. And again, it makes you wonder because Trump is touting this as his sing signature achievement. This is, see, I'm a great negotiator. Look what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm managing this North Korea thing, uh, but what's he going to do when this whole thing is starting to fall like sand through his fingers? No, and you said the correct word that really raised a lot of questions. That's credibility. And we've talked about it on the program, that we're losing credibility, not only in foreign policy when you look at how we're handling the affairs with Iran and, and the Middle East. There's no credibility with what we've been doing. And financially, we're losing credibility. You know, the Europeans now are talking about going on their own. So this, this uh, issue, who would have thought six months ago that there would be an, even a possibility of the president of South Korea saying, look, we want peace. I'm going to North Korea and I'm going to see what we can work out, even if there's a threat of sanctions, you know, this sort of thing. I mean, that would be heroic. I mm -hmm. don't happen to believe it's likely, but I mean, but it's moving in that direction. And when they see a weak spot, you know, our loss of credibility is going to uh, continue uh, to build. And uh, it's certainly that way on the financial affairs, you know, with all these uh, financial sanctions and prohibition of transfer of funds, you see a lot of people seriously talking about another uh, international reserve currency. And, you know, Russia's involved. Uh, they're getting a little bit tired of us. Uh, China gets tired of us because we were involved with China even right now and in Taiwan, you know, what's going to happen there. And, uh, and we've already dismissed any chance of ever talking to, to the Iranians. And India uh, isn't exactly our best friends either. So they have, they have a lot of wealth and they have the, now the motivation, and you know, with technology, maybe the moving to another reserve type of currency might be a little bit easier than it was in the old days to develop over a period of time, you know, who, who would it be issuing the reserve currency and how would it be agreed on? So uh, I think the loss of credibility is occurring. I think this is an episode of once again, uh, of a country, our close allies, that's really dependent on us are willing to say, hey, look, 
look, we're, we're sick, sick and tired of this. Uh, I'm still going. It'll be a shame if he cancels that meeting. Yeah. And that's, it's such an interesting point you make about this kind of slow shifting away from the U.S. Uh, and no one is really paying attention. It's not a big deal. No one's going to drop the dollar completely. But if you look at the momentous mm -hmm. events, even just in the 20th century, I'll often think about the end of the Cold War. You know, first of all, very, very few people predicted it. Uh, and certainly no one predicted it would happen the way it did, which is to basically go out with a whimper. We've talked about it on the show before that, you know, essentially what happened is that uh, East Germans were vacationing in Hungary and they decided they didn't want to go back to East Germany, so they cut the fence and went into Austria. You know, it was a little tiny thing that happened, but then the wave came down. So often big things can happen uh, with very small <laughs> antecedents. But one other thing I want to bring up and I was reading about in the Josh Rogan article uh, is a guy, this is the kind of thing that I think is very important to think about and to consider, is how people, you don't, they're not household names, but they are very important movers and shakers in policy. And we remember Victoria Nuland in Ukraine. Well, here's a fellow called Andrew Kim, uh, born in South Korea, came to the U.S. in high school, career CIA officer, brought into the Korea Mission Center by Pompeo when he was a CIA chief, this is the guy who was seen going, according to Josh Rogan, who was seen going into the White House uh, just yesterday, I guess, meeting with the president. This guy is a huge hawk on North Korea. You know, he left the old country, but he didn't leave the battles behind. He's known as, quote, the Grim Reaper on North Korea and, quote, the messenger from hell. And he was actually involved in planning military strikes on Korea before this peace initiative. So someone like him, whose name is not a household name, uh, is in there with a real agenda and it's driving policy. And we did bring his name up yeah. when uh, the first meeting when Pompeo was going over there, that was his key aide. Mm -hmm. And so we, we knew that the, uh, the cards didn't look too good and that there would be an influence. Although on the surface, there was a lot of positive things. Beneath uh, the, the scene there, we realized that Pompeo's heart wasn't in it, and Kim would guarantee it wouldn't uh, succeed, yeah. and uh, it just you know, kept going. But one thing I wanted to uh, visit with you a little bit more on is, is China and, and Taiwan, because that's ongoing. And that might, uh, we're, we're looking at, in a way, a smaller picture, you know, South Korea and North Korea in dealing with the pros and cons. But uh, maybe uh, the, bigger, the bigger picture here is what China uh, is lining up to do, because uh, some, some have said China sort of likes the status quo right now because, um, you, you know, it, it keeps the confrontation going up. But their big interest in is still an issue with, with China, have a one-China policy. Yeah. And uh, the Taiwanese aren't going to be wimps. And then we have this obligation, uh, you know, I don't think a moral obligation uh, should be a legal obligation either. And no matter what happens over there, I thought it was very interesting. They said, well, it's going to be tough. Uh, it might have been uh, Josh's article. Uh, they, they, it would uh, be tough for even China to invade Taiwan. But they said, oh, those t couple little islands near China uh, might be, which is claimed by Taiwan, yeah. that might be more vulnerable. And I got to think in 19, 1960, yeah. because I heard the debates, you know, uh, Kennedy and Nixon. What would you do if China invades, uh, you know, Kimoy and Matsu, <laughs> you know, and here we are back, back, back to square one again. You know, it never, never changes because attitudes uh, don't change very easily. And Trump hasn't missed the opportunity to blame this uh, North Korea problem on China. He said, uh, you know, I'm being so tough on China, so they're not helping us with North Korea. You know, but the other thing that's interesting, if you factor this in, is that uh, I'm sure you saw this, but China and Russia have announced that they are uh, going to undertake the largest joint war games in the history of the two countries. Massive, massive war games, Russia and China. So if you think about the U.S. getting involved in North Korea, which is on the border of China and Russia, uh, that's, uh, that's getting very interesting when you think about the increased cooperation. We're actually pushing China and Russia into each other's arms rather than separating them. Yeah, and if, if this battle is going on, like I indicate with China and, and the West, the U.S., South Korea, uh, 
this DMZ line may be a, a much more vital line than we'd like it to be because we'd like to see the Korean people uh, get along together. But uh, no, I think the connection, uh, you know, with with China financially, they're going to do it, and they're going to help. Uh, they're go they're going to help Iran. They're going to help buy oil from them and transport it and do all these things. So uh, the, the uh, rosy scenario uh, may be out there superficially right now, but there's a lot of weak spots in, in what we're doing in our economic policy as well as our foreign policy. But for the moment, I think uh, you can understand complacency because, you know, people uh, and, and that's deliberate, too, because uh, you know where they're getting the news. Uh, you know, and I mentioned earlier, here that it, isn't it something that uh, the the left uh, you know we see, we see what's happening we see that there's going to be more belligerency with North Korea in the old days the left would say hey don't do that now they're now they, anything that stir up trouble you know if if it looks from the left now the only thing that seems to motivate them is uh, and it may fit the fit the plans of the neocons but if anything looks like it could embarrass president they're they're yeah. for that and their policies. Their policies flip-flop around almost as much as Trump's uh, do. Yeah, they're, they're so blinded by their hatred of Trump that the word you used before we started was gloating. They're gloating now. Ha ha, Trump, you shouldn't have even tried, it, uh, tried making peace with North Korea. You fool, you should even uh, go more toward war. So it's, it's incredible to see what's happened to a lot of the left. But I would just close my section out by saying, look, just enter North Korea, Korea into Twitter and start scrolling down. You're seeing all the stories that happened once again before the Iraq War, all the big lies, all the gasping stories about how, oh my gosh, uh, North Korea is now starting up its missile production again. Uh, all of these things, they're just trying to feed you war propaganda. Don't listen to it. They want to condition your thinking to open you up to conflict. Don't let them control your mind. <laughs> And I, I want to close with uh, restating a position I've held for a long time when it came up in the presidential uh, uh, debates, uh, whether it was the Middle East or Korea. They said, well, how do you do it? How do you transition? How do you get out of this mess? And of course, I wanted to simplify it. Well, we just marched in. Uh, we, we, can, we can just march out. And of course, we've been in Korea for a long, long time, and I think it's time to do that. And uh, yes, there'll be ramifications. But you know, China's not going to invade California next week, whether we leave uh, South Korea or not. That, that's not going to happen. And uh, so it's, it's something that we have to consider and look at and look at what a non-interventionist foreign policy is all about. And it is connected to economic policies. This whole thing that, uh, you, you know, that uh, Russiagate is so serious that we had to put on sanctions on Russians, uh, on and on. And uh, behind the scenes, whether Republicans or Democrats are involved, it seems like it's that uh, deep state, which is mainly in the business of making money and controlling power and controlling the monetary system. That's what drives things. So that's why I think it's explainable why it's chaotic and it's a mess and nobody clearly understands it and, and why you can't expect to get your news and understanding, you know, from the major networks. There's uh, no major network. I think it really explains you know, what's, what's going on. And uh, you don't hear an explanation of the political system either because that's always just a political fight. Republicans against Democrats, and that is the end. Uh, except for the fact that the people in charge are very, very bipartisan and they support the positions and all that is just fluff in order to distract people from even thinking seriously about things like getting rid of the Fed and getting rid of the income tax and having a government that protects liberty instead of pretending it can tell us how to live, how to run the economy and how we should police the world. Until we address that real issue, we're going to have some problems. But in that regard, I believe we're making progress because I think the younger generation, when they hear the message, they understand exactly what we're talking about. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Liberty Report. Please come back soon.